hobby beekeeping in urban environments. What are my credentials for claiming that I can help you? 64 years of beekeeping. When I was 14, 15 years old, I wandered out in the woods with my dog. My dog chased a rabbit. I sat down to rest. There was an old bee tree buzzing. I got hooked immediately 64 years ago. In that interim, I've done everything there is to do for bees, with bees, to bees. Uh, hobby beekeeper, commercial beekeeper, uh, research scientist for 40 years, lecturer at UC Davis, uh, bee ranking for Hollywood. Unfortunately, I became better known as for bee ranking in Hollywood than I did as a lecturer. Uh, <laughs> never figured that one out. So, uh, the, in my research career, I did, uh, I discovered the uh, pheromones that attract drones to queens during the mating flight. I, I made the first movie of that business, uh, the movie called Mating Behavior of the Honey It was the first X-rated bee film. And, uh, <laughs> Worked very well. The other uh, high point in my research career was developing a magnetic retrieval system for documenting very accurately the flight range and distribution of uh, bees as they fly from the hive. We cop captured them on flowers, glued ferrous metal numbered ID tags on their body. These tags were recovered back at the hive by magnets suspended over the doorway. So when the bee walks in, snap over. Uh, the tag comes free, the bee is unharmed, and we have a doc very good documentation then of where the bee flies, when it was there, how, you know, all the, all the things related to foraging. So yes, they do forage easily up to four miles. <clears throat> now, I'm going to try to tell you how to obtain the highest quality of honey that's possible. We have official judging standards for honey. I used to judge the state fair and such. You look at color, flavor, the uh, particles that might be in it, the uh, moisture content, things like that, and the way it was packaged. These don't mean much on your breakfast table, do they? So what really counts in terms of honey quality? It's, it's what counts to you as a consumer. Your standards for flavor, usually the first flavors you consume when you were a child become imprinted and you like that the rest of your life. But along the way, I've, I've tasted some very, very wonderful honeys. And so the flavor is everything. Forget about the color. In the supermarket, they want amber colored because that's honey colored. Well, believe me, honey comes in colors from clear, clear water-like fluid uh, color to something as dark as used motor oil. It doesn't matter what color it is when you eat it. You can't taste color. And if it's organic, that's a magic term these days. Well, I guess you can say honey is organic. Uh, even though they range on four miles and they collect things from a lot of sources. <laughs> but on the label, we put the word pure, and that's all we need. I wish they would stop doing that because it gives the impression that there must be some impure honey somewhere. There could well be. Uh, some people treasure locally produced honey. Fine, I like that. Uh, most of all, half of honey consumed in the U.S. was produced locally in China. <laughs> and then shift her. <laughs> but if you're a hobbyist, you can be sure that your honey is local. So the answer to honey quality as a consumer is to produce it yourself. You can do it. If you are producing quality honey, there are two ways to deal with it. One is to put it on your table and eat it. That's pretty obvious. What's not so obvious is if you cannot get around to eating that gallon you just bought or produced, what do you do with that? Well, while it's nice and fresh, you put it in smaller containers like pints or quarts, you freeze it, and six years later it'll be just as good as it was today if you put it in the freezer. If you put it in the refrigerator, the granulate, and you'll have a nice block of honey which is still quite edible, quite sandy and granular, but edible, 
It's all right, but you can't get it out of the container if it's in the refrigerator. It's too thick. So uh, either eat it or freeze it, okay? The rewards of public beekeeping are, are many. You can not only produce liquid honey, but you can produce it fresh in the comb. Cut the pieces of comb up, eat the wax with the honey. That is the best container there is, beeswax in the comb. That's where you get the best honey. During harvesting of honey, it comes out of the comb, gets exposed to the air, and it starts to lose its essence and its flavor. So, you can produce this fresh honey right at home, cut it out of the comb, eat it that way. You cannot digest the beeswax, but it doesn't do any harm. You can chew it like chewing gum, or you can swallow it and hope for the best. Uh, no, it doesn't affect you at all. Just eat it, enjoy it any way you can. Um, how much honey can a hobby beekeeper produce in a year? That can be a minus figure. <laughs> or it can be 200 pounds. But let's say it's entirely possible, and in most cases, probable, that you can produce about 100 pounds of honey per hive per year, right in your backyard. And I promise you that your list of friends will grow very dramatically if you start sharing your honey, especially with your near neighbors. They have a knack of running out of honey every other week, and they'll call you. But that's, that's good, you have more friends. Some of you can do that, you know, you can use those friends. Uh, if you get surplus, you can always sell it somewhere. But I'm going to emphasize that I think that uh, hobby beekeepers should only have about two hives. Why? Because the food requirements per colony or hive, as we call them, uh, for the year, about 70 something pounds of pollen must be consumed by each colony per year. Roughly 150 pounds of honey per year, for which they had to collect more, maybe five or 600 uh, pounds of nectar to produce that, no, I mean, about 300 pounds of nectar to produce that uh, 150 pounds of honey. The point is this, folks, within the radius of your foraging area from your hive, there are finite resources. There's only so much nectar, only so much pollen. And if you take more than your share, you're not only sliding yourself, you're sliding your neighbors, because the production per unit can only go as high as the available nectar and pollen in the environment. That's very important. Two hives per hobby beekeeper should be the normal. There are reasons to have more, aside from being just greedy, uh, but, but two hives is a good goal. Am I right, Eric, so far? Of course. Of course, he says. He always says that to me. Uh, you are, as a hobby beekeeper, you are, are doing a tremendous public service. Tremendous. You're pollinating not only their gardens and their fruit trees, you're pollinating berries and other things that wildlife is attracted to in the urban environment. We need bees in the urban environment. Uh, they're finally discovering that after all these years of prohibiting beekeeping in big cities. New York City, for example, has just come around to say, yes, you can be a hobby beekeeper. So all of the underground beekeepers have suddenly surfaced and it's great. Uh, the social aspects, being a hobby beekeeper is not only a bee experience, it's an opportunity to make a lot of new friends. Some of them a little different, but they're still good friends, okay? Uh, just be tolerant and try to understand how they got that way. It wasn't just the stings. Uh, so social aspects, you can join a beekeeping club. That's, they're just cropping up everywhere, and the membership is growing like crazy. So, so consider that. Um, you can be better friends with your neighbors as long as you keep supplying the honey. You get speaking engagements at local schools, a lot of opportunities for social uh, things and bees. Beekeeping, especially hobby beekeeping, is a marvelous opportunity for teaching biology to kids. It's wonderful. 
If kids get the wrong information early on, it usually concerns bee stings and why you should be afraid of bees. The opposite is true. If you remember nothing else today from what I say, remember this. When a bee is out foraging for nectar, pollen, or water, the only way you're going to get stung by this bee is if you step on it or you slap it hard. Otherwise, you can, you can disturb these bees all you want. Uh, the worst that's going to happen is they'll go home. I've actually had people go out and remove landscaping because the bees are all over the flowers. What a tragedy. This week I've been called out twice for bee nuisances. Both times it was a wonderful uh, foraging plant. There was a good concentration of bees getting fall nectar, which is very valuable. And uh, but they, they thought they were nuisances. Well, I, I congratulate them for having those kinds of plants in their yard. Now, beekeeping does cost, by the way, I'm fighting obesity, not only for myself, but for you folks. I've decided to lecture right through your lunch hour today. <laughs> we started a few minutes early, late, so I, I may be a few minutes. Anyway, we're fighting obesity. Now, what, what about the costs of beekeeping? Everything, it's a lot cheaper than golf, believe me. <laughs> yes, sir. And, and, and you don't get hit in the head by golf balls. So, and it's cheaper than gambling, or some types of collectibles. What does it cost to get started in beekeeping? Well, sometimes nothing. Sometimes a, a person has been at the hobby and they, they don't fit very well and they'll give you their hive. It's, but usually it's, it's going to be several hundred dollars just to get into business because you have to have not only hive equipment, you have to have some gear to wear, protective gear. So uh, maybe if we have time, more about that later. The bottom reason for being a hobby beekeeper is that it's just plain fun. There's nothing so rewarding as going out and watching your little bees buzzing back and forth. By the way, how many people here, how many people here do not have hives of bees at this time? Oh, good. Uh, <laughs> how many people have less than 10 hives? All right, how many people have more than 1,000 hives? Well, I was gonna let you be the speaker if you were with me. <laughs> okay. Uh, that tells me that's the, this is the profile I anticipated. A bunch of people that don't like German. Um, <laughs> bees are more fun than African violets. <laughs> that's a basic thing. No. African violets have no personality. Bees buzz, they do things. Get out there and lie on the ground in front of your hive and get stuck, I mean, and watch the activity. <laughs> I've done that. You watch them flying through there, they come in for a landing, and just miss your head and go in the hive. Don't be that at home. Um, so are, are you a candidate for becoming a beekeeper if you're not already one? Well, here's how you judge. All these things I'm saying are in my book, by the way, which is on the way to being a bestseller. It's just starting early. Uh, so, <laughs> So, are you a candidate? Do you, do you love animals? Do you love animals? Bees, you should regard bees as pets. They really are pets, but some people go a little bit too far. Unlike your dog, you know you can talk to your dog and they know what you're saying a lot of the time. But some people go too far with this thing. They go out to the bee hive and they start talking to the bees. That's okay, unless they start to answer you. <laughs> Then don't let anybody see you working on the beehive, okay? Or hear you. Um, so, compared to other pets, bees are a dream animal. You don't have to feed them every other day. They don't bark. They don't scratch. They don't kick you. Um, we're not. We'll talk about stings later. Uh, in fact, we better do that now. That's important. The fear of stings is greatly exaggerated. Stings are a good thing. If we did not have these things, everybody would have bees in the backyard and nobody would make any honey to harvest. Stings are a good thing. So what you have to do is be smart about this. You've got to understand why bees sting 
and then don't do those things. And I've got, that's, chapter 8 in my book will save you stings the rest of your life, so take it seriously, guys. Uh, only 1% of people, 1% are truly hypersensitive to bees to the extent that they go into shock, anaphylaxis, dropping of blood pressure, visual distortion, nausea, sweating. Man, I shouldn't have told you the symptoms. Now you're going to go have them. Anyway, anaphylaxis is serious and can, can kill you if you don't get a shot of epinephrine or adrenaline within 15 to 20 minutes. Respect that. But if you're curious about keeping bees, you might want to go to your allergist first and be tested for your sensitivity. You may be extremely sensitive to a yellow jacket sting and not that sensitive to a honeybee sting. Each species has different components in the venom. So get professional guidance here if you have any doubts. But realize your odds are about 99% that you're just going to have a normal reaction, which is localized swallowing of their dishing and maybe a little bit of pain depending upon where you can stump. You have a lot of nerve endings like the tip of the nose. Ooh, not a good place to get stung. Sting prevention I'll talk about in a few minutes. Now, a backyard beekeeping, you say, well, my backyard is small. I mean, urban beekeeping now happens in small backyards. How much space do you actually need for a hive? Well, you need a lot more space for the flight area than you do for the actual hive. The actual hive is sitting back there on the on the uh, table. That's the size of the hive. That's all the space it needs. But what about the flying bees? Well, people don't understand this. I'm doing research on this right now. People don't understand that you can absolutely direct the flight of bees where you, where you want them to go. How? I'm not showing slides yet, so don't look. All right. Um, how do you direct the flight of bees from hive? Anybody got an idea? Say it. Here's how you do it. <laughs> I did, a, I did a, a, an outdoor bee display at Orange County Fair some years ago. We had over 200,000 bee, uh, bee, uh, people actually uh, visiting this outdoor booth, which was nothing more than a glass chamber about 14, 15 feet high with a roof that was open a little bit so the bees could fly in and out of the roof. I had three standard hives there. Kids could come up within six inches of the hive entrance and hit the glass and blow on them and do anything they want. No risks, whatever. Because the bees were directed up. By the time they got that high up, they were well on their way to foraging, not defensive. Those things that you do to trigger defense in the hive, it's not aggression, it's defense. Those things had to be sensed by the bees. And inside this glass chamber, the bees didn't know you were there. Now you can do other things less expensive, and I'm working on that now. But take, take my word for it, we can't direct the flight of bees straight up and away. And, uh, and literally avoid this question of how much space do I need to have for my hive. That protects the pets from the bees, the bees from the pets, and kids, and wives. You don't necessarily support what you're doing. Um, Now, here's something important. Uh, before you kick off your, uh, your uh, career as a hobby beekeeper, check the local ordinances. If you don't know what they are, then, then uh, you don't know how to rate them. I mean, <laughs> a lot of places say no bees. Well, that means you better be really careful. Uh, the ordinances, all, <laughs> all of the ordinances need to be rewritten. I have not seen any that really do the job properly. Not enough science involved here. Basically, unless you are a nuisance, a provable nuisance, why can't you have those bees there? Now, we're not talking about Africanized bees. We know their mere existence in the backyard is a nuisance by definition because they can be set off at any moment and they will affect a large number of people in a large area. They'll kill all the animals in the area. So, but in Sacramento, in this area, we're lucky they're not here. And we don't think they're gonna get here, at least I don't. So, uh, we wanna rewrite all these ordinances. They, they concern the area definitions, the setbacks, the number of hives, the registration, the qualifications of the beekeeper, penalties for non-conformance, all these things need to be reconsidered in my mind. We should have a national ordinance 
not one for each little city. Now, Eric, you told me I had to say something about swarming. That adds 30 minutes to my lecture, you see. Uh, how do you start your hobby? Basically, you can buy a hive already, already set up for yourself, and miss a lot of the fun. Or you can get what we call a little nucleus colony and put in, start with fresh comb and everything. I'll show you some pictures later. You can do it that way. You can, go, you can buy bees by the pound in the screen packages. That's a neat way to go, get a queen too. And you can go out and catch a swarm. The swarming is what happens usually in the spring season. The colony increases in population, they divide in half, one half migrates to a new location, and the new location, the new nest site can be the wall of a house or a hollow tree nearby or some other place where they are in nuisance. So we try to prevent swarming. The answers are in my book. Basically, you divide the hive prior to the swarm coming out. That simulates the swarm experience to the bees. And that's the easy way to do it. But there are other ways to do it too. Uh, certainly don't try to have your hive in one chamber in the spring. It's guaranteed to swarm. Give them space to expand. That's also, everything I'm gonna say is pretty much in my book, so there. Uh, when do you start your hobby? In the spring, not now. There's a seasonal picture of bees that uh, that means that they got grow in population and uh, and uh, they're going to swarm in season. So the seasonal picture is also in that book. So I, now Eric, you mentioned somebody mentioned about moving hives. A question about how far can you move hives? You're going to relocate across your backyard as opposed to 20 miles away. Here's a good big basic rule. Don't move the hive more than five feet a day or less than about two or three miles. You can have that, that's the option. You can move them a great distance away and then two or three weeks later, after the foraging population is turned over, move them back to your other side of the backyard. At home, I just move them five or 10 feet a day. Let them have a day or two of flight to adjust to that and then move them again. They'll keep going with you. All right. Um, so to get into hobby beekeeping, you need information. Where do you go? I can tell you where not to go first. Don't go to the internet unless you already know the answer. Okay. Because we have too many hobby beekeepers who are bubbling with enthusiasm and excess knowledge, most of which is incorrect. You cannot trust what you read on the internet. Uh, your good sources might be people like, uh, well, uh, at state and federal uh, and county uh, advisors or you know, researchers. People like Eric Musson, that's his job. Go to people that know what the heck they're talking about. Don't go to other hobbies. Go to other hobbies, yes, have a mentor when you first start. Work with them, but don't believe much of what they say. Just uh, filter it out for yourself. All right. The problem that we have with bees, all of us, is that we treat bees as little people. We think they have feelings, they have knowledge, we give them all kinds of credit for integrating these this myriad of wonderful activities that enables them to put everything together in a sensible, efficient way. I submit to you that each individual bee in this colony, it doesn't know who it is, it doesn't know why it's there, it doesn't know what it's doing, and it doesn't know what it did. That doesn't mean it can't remember things in its little robot brain that it remembers beautifully, time of day, location, food, many things. These folks, these bees, are just little insect robots. And I'm gonna I'm going to offend you now. They're so much like cockroaches and termites and all the other two million insects that uh, you should, you gotta look at them in terms of what they really are. They are reflexive creatures. As higher animals, we have thoughts, we have abilities, we can project in time, we can imagine. And, and also we're strongly visual. We're strongly visual. Things that go on inside the hive are done in the dark. We're looking at dances in artificial light, interpreting the dances visually. 
Well, they're correlates, they're yes, but the real signals are done in the darkness, and we're not giving adequate weight to things like touch, sound, electrical signals. Those are areas of research that we still have not explored adequately. It's fun to look at all these fancy bees and, and, and interpret them. I've done it all my career. And when you're teaching, uh, Brian, you're right, you did specs on teaching today. That's, that's the way to go. But nonetheless, the researchers should look at the basics of the bee behavior. So don't become anthropomorphic. Be scientific. You push the right buttons at the hive, you get the right response. It's that simple. All right. So you've got to be a student of bee behavior all the way to, to work with. Now, uh, uh, I think you think Brian had mentioned footprint pheromones. Well, that's nothing new, guys. We didn't wear shoes until we got in the seventh grade in the town school where I came from in Florida. And we had footprint pheromones, and they were, they were quite normal, you see. My mom made us wash my feet every night for that reason as well. Okay. Um, why do bees sting? Eric touched on it. Why do they sting? Well, there, if I take my fist and swing it in your face, what do you do? You flinch. You blink your eyes, you blink your arm. How much thought did you put into that? None. Same way for the complicated behavior of bees. If you don't agree with me, just don't say anything. All right. Now, here's what controls defensive behavior at the hive. Motion, <laughs> color, darker colors, darker colors stimulate the defensive bees. Odors, especially, especially carbon dioxide. Do not breathe on your bees. It's worse than beer anatosis. To be carbon dioxide is a super stimulus to release the defensive behavior. Uh, don't walk up to a hive and take your smoker and say, okay, I'm going to do a good job here today. Boom. You put your hive on your smoker on the hive tool and you have a sudden earthquake inside the hive. Okay? Don't do that. So factors that control the, the uh, inclination to, to defend the hive, to sting out, if these factors are complex, but here's what, here's what really controls it to some degree. Genetics, obviously. Africanized bees are more sensitive and respond differently than European bees that we have here. So that's one thing. Colony population. When you first start keeping bees, start with a small colony. Learn the skills of manipulation in a colony that's not very defensive. But later on, when the population doubles and triples, they're going to be more defensive. Time of day. I was told as a beginner that if you really want to work the bees, you go out there at night when they can't see you. <laughs> Yes. If you want a, a, a rough time, go out at night. They, they just they crawl and they sting without provocation. Okay. The best time to open your eyes is when the bee flight is the greatest. One third of the bees may be gone. The other two thirds are happily processing happily. That's an anthropomorphic term. Don't let me do it again. The other two are busily processing two thirds processing honey. And other foods. So that's the time to open your hive when the flight activity at the entrance is maximum. Okay? Um, chronic disturbance. If you have skunks in your area that come around and scratch the entrance every night and, and the bees run out and eat and all, uh, then, then uh, that can in increase the defensiveness. Uh, current weather conditions. They don't like cloudy and windy, cool weather sometimes. Uh, how do you prevent stings, folks? That's the $64 question. How do you prevent the stings? Here is my recipe. First, do not regard your, your uh, clothing, your veil, your, all the stuff you wear, do not regard that as your primary protection. It's not. It does give you protection, gloves, all the stuff, but that's not what you should be thinking about. You should be thinking about preventing the defensive behavior in the first place. So if I were to have to make a choice between opening a hive uh, with smoke or without smoke, 
and with the defense of our clothing on. I would, I would do without the clothing, and I would take the smoke. It would be embarrassing, but I would do it. Uh, because the smoke is the key. It's the key to controlling defensive behavior. Stop the behavior before it starts. How? You produce good quality smoke. That means having a very large smoker, that means using the right fuel, that means when it comes out of the smoker, it's white, it's cool, not hot. You can puff it right in your finger or your back of your hand, and if it's hairy like mine, then all the hairs will curl up if this, the smoke is too hot. Cool, dense, white smoke. Remember that. Now, you approach the hive during maximum flight activity. You smoke. You puff the smoke directly inside the hive, not at the front, two feet back. You get down two inches from the entrance, and you puff all the way across, puff, 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 and you come right back, puff, 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 making sure that hive is literally filled with smoke. Now, the key question here, the key uh, procedure, is to back away and do something else for three or four minutes before you open the hive. They must have time to respond to the smoke. They go into the cells, they ingest nectar, honey and all, it does weigh a lot of good. So this smoke, properly applied, wait time, and you have already stopped the defensive reaction. Don't forget, if you have more than one hive, you better smoke them all at the outset. Even big commercial beekeepers fail to do this. So go in and smoke every hive in the apiary, now come back and start working on your first hive. And you will find that's a great thing to do. Now, um, Okay, I think uh, that's pretty good. Um, I mean, how, to, how to get rid of a sting, Eric referred to that, he covered that uh, pretty well. The main thing is you have to sting out very quickly. I use my finger now, that's the quickest way. If you can wipe the venom and not suck on your clothing, then you're, you've got a pheromone labeled source to walk around in. If you instead step back from the hive out of the intensive defensive zone right near the hive, step back. Wash the sting and get the sting out of it quickly, two cycles. Then you wash that area with just pure water. Take a moment to think what you did wrong to get that sting. Get your smoker and go back and smoke them again, and you'll be much better off. Okay? Uh, choosing hive equipment. I don't have time to go into all that today. But basically, choose factory made equipment. Do not go out there and create your own individual original cook hive design. It doesn't pay. Start off with standard equipment, other beekeepers can advise you. And once you make a decision to shop and buy one company, stay with it because there's some minor variations in the dimensions of hive equipment between companies. Um, if you are getting old like I am and you have trouble lifting these heavy things, consider using uh, shallow supers, you know, smaller chambers actually. So uh, one of these deep chambers full of honey must weigh around 85 pounds or so. Most of us don't like that. But remember, you can always take out one frame at a time, divide and conquer. Okay? Um, you must know the life cycle of the bee in greatest detail. That is a, that is a requirement. Uh, because many events happen in time and you need to know them. Um, so work with a beekeeper mentor, join a local bee club, read good bee books, all you can get. The best books, the best hobby book available, modestly speaking now, is mine. It's back there on the camera. <laughs> it's not just my opinion. It's a look on Amazon. It's just been reviewed by 17 reviewers, 14 of which gave it a five-star top rating. And the other three didn't know what they were talking about. <laughs> so, um, I, I, I'm going to run out. I just have a few copies left. I didn't bring enough. So if you really want one of these, or one of them, I, I can feel like how heavy it is. I'll show you. Okay, let's, uh, let's shift over to some of my visuals. Check, check. Okay. Sorry. Right. I'm supposed to be using this one? No, you got one. Okay, good. Okay. okay, here we are with the visuals. This is a hive uh, owned by the, the uh, most popular hobby beekeeper in the world right now. 
Michelle Obama. <laughs> uh, this is at the White House. And it's totally ridiculous because they got it up on this stand. Nobody can see it, get near it, you can't work with it. But doesn't it make a nice picture? Uh, this is my friend who just got started in beekeeping, uh, Tommy Smothers. Smothers Brothers? No, no applause, okay, anyway. Uh, <laughs> all right, uh, Tom, Tom is a very curious type, and he went out uh, to look, he, he, I showed you how to light the smoker. He peered over the smoker, and you see that hole in the veil? <laughs> Perfect circle. For those of you just starting, this is a cut cutaway of a standard hive equipment. We won't go into detail, whatever. It's just a series of boxes with multiple foam side by side. You can see them in the back here, get much more out of it. This is the way foam start as a, a sheet of wax and box with the precise cell dimensions that the bees will build on it. Without this, they'll build their own comb, but it won't be nice and straight. You, you can use plastic comb uh, foundation like this. I recommend beeswax to start with. Later on, when you know what you're doing, then you'll stick with beeswax. <laughs> okay, uh, this is the bee secreting beeswax. Uh, yeah, beeswax. See the white flakes on the underside of the abdomen? There are eight, there are eight little glands there. They take those little flakes, and in the total darkness of the hive, they fashion this with their mouth parts into this wonderful architecture, the honeycomb. This is an observation hive. Uh, Brian uh, brought one in, it's in the back to look at it later on. But it shows a cross section of a standard hive. If you were just to take these two combs out of the middle of the standard hive boxes, you would see the brood in the lower area and the honey storage in the upper area. Uh, a lot of beekeepers put a little mark on their queen. I like to have a number of plastic tag on mine, so she thinks she's specially up. <laughs> this is a drone right in the dead center. Uh, big eyes. If you don't know what a drone looks like, they're wonderful. They have no sting. The life cycle starts with eggs. This is the most difficult thing to see, but this proves that your queen was there and working within the last three days. Because it takes three days for an egg to hatch. He's hatching the tiny larvae. Um, okay, I can't see it well here, but they, they, as you get, we get away from the more mature brood that's been kept, you get older brood, and then somewhere over here, I think you'll see some very tiny larvae and a C shape lying right on top of the brood food. It's white like mayonnaise. If you take a comb out of the hive that's mature and you, sweep, you brush all of these off and you keep this warm for an hour or so, you'll be surprised to see all these baby bees coming out. They're, they're adult bees, but they're not fully formed. They can't sting, they can't fly. They're wonderful to put in a little glass and take to school to show kids. Uh, so that's one way to do it. This, uh, judging the queen's performance is everything in a hive. This represents the typical uh, pattern of brood formation. And it's, there are very few open cells, meaning that the survival rate was very high, no disease and such, so that's what you want. And then there's normally a little uh, perimeter of pollen stored around here. And then, of course, the honey gets stored in the upper parts of the chamber. This is a, a bee with pollen in the dead center there, 230, and, and pollen stored in there. Another drone, you see that, two drones, actually. Now, uh, I could spend an hour talking on this one slide, but I won't. Aren't you glad? Now, <clears throat> this picture is in my book, and it describes the seasonal profile. You must have in mind, when you're a hobby beekeeper, you must have a seasonal picture of us, what you want to do to anticipate developments. This tells all about it. I can't uh, say more than that in time. When you want to harvest your honey, it comes out like this. Uh, these frames in the middle are uh, cells that are capped with cured honey. You simply cut the cappings off with a hot knife, exposing the honey in the cells. You drop these into a some kind of centrifuge. Rolls around, honey comes out, runs down the sidewalls, 
and delivers in this spout. You put it through some kind of crude filtration to get out the rubber boots. I mean, the, the little pieces of wax and stuff. Uh, and that's all the spending you really need to, to make it a, a good home product. Commercially, of course, they spend more rigorously. If you don't want to do that, here's the comb honey I produced at home. You cut it up little pieces, jab it with a toothpick or something in the kitchen. Like, See that? <laughs> I mean, that, that's, not a, that's not a posed picture. Oh, yes, it was. <laughs> now, uh, when you're working with an eye, you become very observant. You must. You see this bee right at the eye entrance? That's a guard bee. I'm going to call her a soldier bee. That's fine. She's very super alert. See those antennae extended? She's going to smell and touch the writing. And if things get a little bit more stimulating, she lifts her front legs up like this. And when she gets like this, boy, she is unready. The red light is on. You don't move fast. You don't, you know, you better smoke right away. Uh, here's your protective gear. If you didn't notice, that's me inside there. It doesn't detract too much. But anyway, your, your basic tools, your smoker, your eye tool, and your some kind of protection. Here's your nice white smoke. This is your key to everything. Uh, here are some stingers. If you didn't do it right, you can see them. They're chipping from my finger. It's my finger. And uh, they haven't been there more than a second because they haven't penetrated fully yet. When they penetrate fully, they look like this, and you begin to get some inflammation around that sting, but you can still see it. Um, I'd like to compliment Kathy Garvey. She is a fabulous, fabulous macro photographer. Most of my good, good pictures she provided. Is Kathy here? Raise your hand if you are. Oh, there she is. Here, I'm smiling, Kathy. Take my picture. Never mind. Okay, here's a bee. Here's a bee that uh, just came home and she's coated with little yellow things, pollen grains. That's, they become like a little brush. They go from flower to flower, brushing off some of those little. And here's a bee uh, uh, foraging for water. Isn't that a nice little head in the water? I love it. Uh, get up really close to the bee and begin to see the, the major parts. We won't go into it, but the main thing here is that tongue. You can see that. It's, it's kind of a feathery, hairy thing, and it, by capillarity, it just sucks up liquid, just like that. And then she pumps it back into her body, and I'll show you that in a minute. Get a really, this is a fabulous macro photographer uh, in Germany gave you this. Look at the compound eye, all this hair sticking out. You can even see the little hexacon units. There are thousands of little, uh, almost any yeah, other tiny eyes that merge into one compound eye, giving a, some kind of visual signal. Look down in the lower center, you will see hairs. They're branched. All, almost all the bees' hairs are branched or somehow specialized. Here's one of Kathy's shops, I think. Bee is really going after it. Now, here's what you gotta understand. When a bee is out foraging, uh, she starts off with a honey stomach, a, a tan area in the middle. She starts out with a relatively empty honey stomach. It's like a tiny balloon. Now, when she fills up, look what happens. She can bring home well, the bee weighs about 90 when milligrams empty. When she comes back home, she may weigh 150 milligrams. Amazing. And she can carry a load of pollen on top of that. And experimentally, I made them carry a lot more than that. Uh, little kids love bees and beekeeping. They just give them a chance. But these are my granddaughters, and I got her into uh, uh, studying bee foraging behavior. We trained the bees to the table and her number, and she recorded the times of visitation. Pretty soon she was betting with her sister which bee was going to do the most work, like a horse race or something. And uh, this picture, this picture came from a, a book called The Day of the Life of California. That's me. Um, and uh, just having fun. I do play that by the way, too. Um, the book is on the back table there. I'm not sorry. <laughs> Okay, I've got one more. Let's see. Can you help me with the video? I've got a very, very short video. You're fine. You're fine. Okay. Carefully exhales Oops, the on. scent of the artificial nectar and shrimp. The sponge is placed in the mouth, and Dr. Geary carefully exhales. The scent of the artificial nectar attracts the swarm of bees to his lips and away from his nostrils, which are unprotected and vulnerable to the aggressive swarm. Watch here as scent will dart in and out around his nose. The stains here will block his only airway once his mouth is filled with bees. Dr. Gary opens his mouth and the bees crowd in. It's impossible. 
impossible to count at this point, but it's safe to say dozens of bees are now pushing and fighting at the back of Dr. Gary's throat. Dr. Gary now closes his mouth, packed full of the stinging insects, and gives his crew the signal to start the 10 second clock.